this morning we're going to look at Jesus cleansing the temple primarily out of the book of John. We'll get into a little bit more here in a minute, but it's interesting to note that this story is in the Gospel of John at the beginning of John, and it's in all the other three Gospels towards the end. Um, and we're, like I said, we're going to look at that a little bit more, but um, for right now, just kind of an interesting little side note. This is kind of the transition time again, this, this whole transition that was taking place when, uh, you might say, from the time of the law to the time of grace. Jesus coming into this world in the beginning of his ministry and the things that were happening, but it was how the law isn't eliminated, but it's a much better understanding from what the law is to understanding what grace is. And in order to understand this whole cleansing of the temple a little bit better, we need to look at what John records just before for some reason. And that's the wedding feast at Canaan. Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. It's kind of a list, of, almost kind of a foundational thing, and I think to a certain extent is the reason why it's placed where it is. But the wine ran out, if we remember right. But we stop and look at what was happening in, the, in Judaism was the spirit had run out in their lives. They, their worship had ran out. It, it had been, become so perverted and so far off track that it, there, there no longer was really a true worship. And it ran out. But then Jesus comes and he commands the servants to fill the water pots. And if you notice in there, it says, fill them to the brim. Okay, they were, but this is what Jesus does, is he fills us not just full, but full to overflowing. So that whole transition from law to grace is demonstrated in that one miracle. More so than we normally would think of. But you've got these six empty water pots the spiritual condition of Israel. And only Jesus could fill it. He fills us to the point of overflowing. This is what Jesus has done. And there's a little paragraph in um, Arthur Pink's book uh, on this, commentary on this. And I don't know if you've ever read Arthur Pink or not, but I, I really enjoy, he's one of, the, one of these old theologians from back in the turn of the century. And, and those were back when they had intelligent people, um, other, unlike today. But anyway, um, and how blessed to note that the mother, brother, and, and disciples of Christ, who represented respectively the nation of Israel privileged, but unbelieving, the little remnant who did believe, went down to Capernaum, the place of divine judgment. See, Capernaum was the, right, see, right after that miracle was turning the water into wine, they went down to Capernaum. And what, who went was the mother, the brothers, the disciples. So you had kind of an, an illustration here of the privileged people of Israel because they had received all of the privileges of God working through them. And then you have the disciples, which say they were the brothers of Jesus who at this point didn't believe. And you had the disciples who did believe. They were just a small remnant, so there was a remnant that believed. But going down to Capernaum, Capernaum was kind of the headquarters of Jesus' ministry. He went there a lot. But there also is an understanding of Capernaum. Jesus had made a prophecy about them saying that if the miracles done by, for you in Capernaum would have been done in Sodom, Sodom would still be existing yet today. Jesus really condemned them. But the fact that they went down to Capernaum, and so they're going down to Hades, but Jesus went with them. So Jesus is with them even in their total sinful state. He's still providing. He still has the opportunity to fulfill, to fill the pot, to the overflowing. The little, sometimes those little lines, those little wording have more meaning than just what it says if you start comparing it to other things. So now we're going to look at John placing the story. 
Why does John place this story at the beginning and the other three close to the end? I believe, and, there, and this is one of those that's up for debate and you can dispute it, and, any, and it's not one of these cases of this is worth dying for, um, illustrations, okay? I think because Jesus turned the water into wine adds to the foundation of the teaching. The, the Bible doesn't always represent things in chronological order. It has a tendency sometimes to say it, put things in different orders, and we have to go through and we find there's, the chronology doesn't necessarily fit in the way that it was written, but it's all there. Uh, some will say that Jesus actually cleansed the temple twice, once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end. And there is a legitimate argument for that. Okay? Like I said, this isn't one of these that you're going to make a big issue out of. See, because it's, you'll find this story in Matthew 21, in Mark 11, in Luke 19, and in John 2. And if you look at the placement, it's always all the other three are at the end. And uh, I say in the in John's, it's at the beginning. But it doesn't mean that it was in the beginning. I don't think there was two. And we're going to look at that a little bit more, too. Now we can look at Exodus 12. Verse 11, now you shall eat this in this manner, your loins girded and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This is from when the children of Israel, the last of the 10 plagues, where the angel of death was coming through, they were prepare this meal, they were to mark the doors with blood so that the angel would pass over. That's what the Passover is all about. But notice it says, it is the Lord's Passover. Don't forget that line. In John 2, 13, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Do you see how it had changed? It was the Passover of the Lord. That's how it was instituted. That's how it was established. By this time in history, it had become the Passover of the Jews. They had literally taken this commandment of God, this whole ceremony, and had changed it so much that it no longer was the Lord's Passover. See, we can do the same thing if we're not careful with communion. It is the remembrance of what Jesus has done for us, and we can start doing it in such a way, in such a routine, that it becomes our communion service. Yes. And that's really what's going, what's going on here, is you had something that was established, was holy, and was perverted. And believe me, we are very good at that. But then also, when Jesus, there was another thing that Jesus had talked about this house, you know, make my father's house a, a den of thieves, and we're going to look at that a little bit more too. But let's look at Matthew 21, verse 12. I'm going to use Matthew and John primarily. I, I, you can go to, I'm going to say to uh, Luke and Mark and look at a lot of these things too, but in order to just not uh, grab every one of them, um, the overall see the, uh, the continuity between the two stories. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturning the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. In John 2, 14 and 15, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Jesus drove out the oxen and the sheep. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. Now, why is this listed just this way? Um, first of all, we have to understand what was taking place here was a miracle. They say, what miracle? Jesus comes in there, he sees what's going on, and uh, he is really upset about it. So he makes up this whip and just starts driving them all out. But stop and think, what's going on here? You have the Jews in their temple. They have their own security on staff. Armed security is there. You have the priests, they're going to tolerate somebody coming in and doing this. 
the fact that they tolerated it and one man drove out as many as a thousand people there could easily have been a thousand people inside this area or even more and one man drove them all out that's a miracle they literally had the fear of God in them literally but then notice how he did it he drove out the sheep and the oxen important to remember he drives them out the money changers he overturns their tables and the ones that are selling the doves he overturns their seating and then tells them to get out why well because there's mercy our God is a God of mercy the oxen and the sheep could be rounded back up the money on the floor could be picked back up the doves if he had busted open the cages they would not have been able to get them back because they would have flown away in the midst of his anger he demonstrated mercy Isn't that amazing our God is an amazing God that's one of those little things that I found I have never heard before I never saw before but it's there in the middle you gotta remember I have a, I have a lot to learn oh I, I think it was literally the fear of the Lord was on them the Holy Spirit put a fear in them that nobody stood up to them you know all it would have taken was one guard with a sword to come over here and say hey, you can't do this you know and struck him down that's the way it normally would have happened but because of the fact that it was Jesus and this miracle was taking place and we've never looked at this story as a miracle we look at the story of righteous anger that's the story well there's a lot more to the story back in Ezekiel 33 and verse 31 they come to you as the people come and sit before you as my people and hear your words but they do not do them for they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth and their heart does not go their heart goes after their gain A prophecy this is what people do they come into the temple and no longer is this a place of worship a place of prayer it is a become a house of merchandise uh, buying and selling the way to gain profit it is all about self it's lustful desire lusting after the things of this world the people hear the words the priest the Levites are teaching them they have the Torah they and you know, most young Jews would have had it memorized that was part of growing up so they knew these words so they were given all this instruction but they didn't follow it how many of us today do the same thing we hear the words every week we read our Bibles through the week and we all these words do we follow it or is it this is really good to know it's easy to fall into that it really is I know that from personal experience there have been many times in my life where I, I knew better but I didn't anyway I'm as guilty as anyone but this is what today the modern church to a large extent has become it has become a place to where they hear they say wow that was a good message and then life goes on in Matthew 21 13 and he said to them it is written my house shall be called a house of prayer but you are making it a den a robber's den and this is from I say Isaiah 56 7 the three Gospels Matthew Mark and Luke use this phrase John does not it's one of the things in John 2 is to stop making my father's house a place of business now there is one of the times where there is a difference but here again I see no reason why Jesus didn't say both but because the writers have their own perspective on things that they would write and you can do this with the gospel so often you can take a story and you can see if you look at it in all four gospels they don't contradict each other they're just adding more information and I think this is really what's happened here but 
Why did Jesus say a house of prayer? Why didn't he say a house of worship? That interesting? Or a place where God's people gather in love? A place to be fed? He said a house of prayer. Everything that happens in this world, God is in control. But how does he work? He works through the prayers of his people. This is a house of prayer. This is the beginning of movement of the Holy Spirit into the world and into each other. Without prayer as a foundation, there is nothing else after that. Prayer is so important in the life of a believer that things do not happen without it. If we do not pray, it's kind of like God sits on his hands. A house of prayer has to be what this place is. Prayer is the first and foremost part. Everything that comes out of it afterwards is all because of prayer. So Jesus saying this is my father's house, house of prayer was the foundation of how God works. It is so necessary. We have to see that, we have to understand that, we have to realize that prayer must be the foundational driving force in our lives. Why is prayer so important? Because it's a dependency thing. It demonstrates our dependence upon God, not on self. We don't pray to God giving him the thanks that, well, you just made me so smart, and you made me so strong, and you made me... No. We go in prayer because I need, I want, please, Lord. It's always, prayer is always putting ourselves lower. That's why we love to pray ourselves in silence. Because we don't want like to publicly declare ourselves as lower, as less. Privately, we have no problem with it. But to do it publicly is far more difficult. But prayer, again, the foundation of the way that God's Spirit works through His people. In Matthew 21, 23, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority did you do these things and who gave you this authority? Parallel one in John 2, 18, and the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? In other words, who gave you the right to do this? Stop and think. They didn't even stop to think about the fact that Jesus actually pulled it off. Obviously, he had some authority. And the only authority that could possibly have pulled it off, and even they should have grasped that, was the power of God working through this man. They should have been able to see that so clearly because of the fact nobody else, no other way could this have been pulled off. But they got to ask the question, what gives you the right to do this? What sign will you show us that gives you this right? Authority in life, where does it come from? We have all sorts of authority. We have the authority as a parent. We may have authority as a teacher or in our position at work um, where we have authority over this or over that. All of us have authority over something. For some, it might be authority over our dog, but nothing else. But anyway, it's at least it's authority. We all have authority and it was derived from our position of who we are. Jesus had the authority, the authority given to him by the Father. Now it doesn't get any higher than that. So Jesus was demonstrating his all authority. The center of Israel's ceremonial purity was the temple. Only Jesus could call it his Father's house. Nobody else can do that. This is my father's house. Only the Israelites could speak of God in their midst. Now he was there before their eyes. A light shined in the darkness and they still did not see. 
And we say, how dumb could they be? How dumb can I be? Because how many times have I looked and seen God work, seen God doing things, and I just thought, wow, that worked out pretty good. Now God's in the midst. His Spirit is with us. Now we're going to break it down a little bit more. We're going to look at seven, I say, I call bullet points. Um, the time, the need, the method, the cause, um, the Jews' demand and Christ's reply, um, Christ's miracles in Jerusalem, and the unsatisfactory result, Christ's knowledge of the human heart. The time. John 2.13, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Okay, so now it's establishing a time. And even if you want to take it that this was one of two, it doesn't matter. Because the other Gospels talk about it took place just before the Passover. Jesus was, his earthly ministry covered four Passovers. Okay, he wasn't here for four years, but because he was, his ministry was about three and a half years long, it actually spanned four Passovers. He started it at the beginning of one. There were two in the middle and one right at the end. All right, so that's, that's the time. The need. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. He saw the corruption that was going on. He saw the need to clean up this corruption. He sees the need in our lives too. What needs to be cleaned? Verses 15 and 16, the method. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of a place of business. He took action. He didn't just stand by and permit it to go on. He took a stand because it was needed to be but also he had a method. And we looked at that method, how in that method, in the midst of his driving everything out, he also showed mercy in the midst of it. When we are dealing with people, we have to keep this in mind, that when we are dealing with people, and even though they are wrong, we must attack it with mercy. Christ is our example. The cause of the cleansing, verse 17. His disciples remembered what was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The disciples remembered later on that this was a statement that uh, was in Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah, I forget, it's Isaiah, it's in Isaiah. That's where he was quoting from. But zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus has a zeal for his house. He has a zeal for his place where his people come to pray and to worship. Worship comes out of it. And then a demand for the sign. Jesus said to him, what sign, the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us your authority for doing these things? They wanted more proof. Like I said, there should have been plenty of proof already, but they wanted more. Just not satisfied. We're going to ask more questions. We're going to dig deeper into this before we, well, maybe if we dig deep enough, we can find that you really don't have the authority. Christ replied, Jesus said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, that wasn't a very sufficient reply because destroy this temple it took 46 years to build this temple but of course we know Jesus was talking about the temple of his body and that was what he gave him the authority because he was there doing the will of the father he was there to suffer and die for us he had the authority because the father had given him the authority Christ's miracles and the results for some. 
now in verse 23. And when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was still doing. Many believed, many saw the things that were going on, but many isn't all. Here again, there was an overwhelming amount of evidence there. But some people are just so hardened that they will not believe, regardless. But that belief was also kind of tempered. And here's where verses 24 and 25. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, that is a, almost kind of a difficult little passage to look at until we see really where he's coming from. The people that were believing, they were seeing the miracles, they were seeing all these wonderful things that were going on, and it was kind of like jumping on the bandwagon. Oh yeah, that Jesus guy, I mean, he, he is really great. I mean, did you see what he's done? I mean, uh, he's, he's done all these miracles, he's healed people, and, and you might say, you listen to his preaching, I mean, it is really good preaching. Oh yeah, I believe in him. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe he says who he is. But there was no commitment. See, we can believe, but not commit. And if we don't commit, that demonstrates that our belief is just surface. There has to be commitment. This is why he didn't entrust himself. In other words, he didn't put himself in a trusting mode of mankind because he knew that mankind was not trustworthy. We are not trustworthy. In and of ourselves, we're not very trustworthy. We will go to certain limits and then we can try to fix it, try to set it aside. I've seen this primarily in business where you take somebody who's been in business for a while and they've semi-successful or successful and then something happens. Something happens to the point to where they no longer are successful but it's going downhill rapidly. So they struggle and they strive and they connive on how do I deal with this because the embarrassment factor is so great that they cannot let anybody know what is happening. They can't let anybody see that their bank account is empty and they no longer can fulfill the promises I've made and I no longer can continue on. So they try to do things in any way they possibly can so as not to get caught. And I've known a Christian man who did this. I mean, a very active Christian man. And when his business went down, he would fuddle, he would take a deposit on something, use it, apply it to other things, and he kept playing that game until it, yeah, until it finally caught up with them. And that was because of the embarrassment. But we have things in our lives that we're, if we're not careful, that we will allow ourselves to slowly on. It doesn't happen overnight, but slowly on we go down to this point to where we'll kind of step over that line in order to save face. We have to be very careful with that that we don't even begin down that road. And we're all capable of going down it. This is to believe but not commit. This is what idolatry is. Idolatry is what Jesus found in his father's house. Because the people were no longer looking at themselves. Obviously they were looking at themselves instead of with their gain, instead of true worship. So we're going to look at three more things. First, the blinded priesthood. Second, the joyless nation. And third, a desecrated temple. John 2, 22. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. The priesthood was blinded. They had Jesus in their midst. They saw all the things that were going on. But the disciples... They saw the same things. The priesthood was blind. The disciples were not, thankfully. And the joyless nation, this nation was looking for 
a savior. But they were looking for a savior from the Romans. There was no joy in this man Jesus. I mean, yeah, he's doing some good stuff, but you're supposed to overthrow the Romans. And then a desecrated temple. Buying and selling, cheating people because it was corruption that was going on. Taking the house of God and making it a place of business. That's desecrating. Now that we've heard the word, do we believe? See, every week we come here and we hear the word of God. Do we believe? But we go back all the way to the beginning. If we commit, we're cleansed. Jesus cleansed the temple. He needs to cleanse our lives. If we commit, we get cleansed. Thanks be to God.